I was born from dark ether, and then my eyes were opened. As remembrance serves, I have chased, caught, and defeated many, as is my nature. Earth and winged pieces of sky are familiar, yet the moon baffles all. Her ghostly presence disturbs the will somehow. Tremendous some nights. Then she licks herself clean until she disappears. Ah, but she is not absent. She waits, she hides, and then slowly uncurls, filling her belly with stars. She follows everything, yet follows nothing, creeping coolly. The trees, rooftops, and clouds heavenly conspirators and guards, a most wise, old, calculating queen. How does she eat when she is legless, wingless? Again and again she casts a net over all but shadows, though even the shadows are commanded for they lean, stretch, and walk along the land as they must. I have seen many succumb, dusted in her powder, never to wake again. Yes, I have seen it happen, yet I, the Q, shall not lie down. Before meeting the healer, I was nameless. These days I come and go from her cottage, which faces southeast. One of its quartered round eyes is always open, peering over the low garden wall toward the ancient oak wood. I have lived and traveled longer than one would expect of a small one such as myself. Dear listener, you would not believe my age. The following story, most meaningful to me compared to all others in my long life, is the reason I stay with her. These days I hunt for recreation and to keep the eyes and mind sharp. But oh, the healer. She is no ordinary human, for she will often climb to the roof to survey with me, having found her own way up before I arrived. To reach the roof, she will shimmy up the trellis backing the house, then deftly and barefooted climb the chimney's flat and jutting stones like steps. From our vantage we sit quietly, our thoughts circuitous and commingling. When she speaks, her voice is music to my pricking ears about all that grows and all that breathes, lulling most questions I have. All I need do is look up at her and she will tell, revealing answers as the wind may lift leaves in a breath. And so, this following story, when the healer thought me lost. Slipping from the cottage by the kitchen door, the sun setting, 
The air teasing, urging an escape. I disappeared in the night, indifferent. From inside she called after me, her voice blending with a brief shower, sinking in the grass. Pausing in the garden for the direction, I listened for the most persistent drift. Her footsteps startled me to the way, and I went, definite as a fish darts from pointed shadows of my ears in a stream. Once free, I glanced backward. The cottage windows glowed in the twilight. She a single flame atop a candle in the doorway, constant and true. So I, a sleek blackness by the wall, shimmied under a scratch of blackberries. The low, narrow, under-tangled door locked, yet I, the key, slipped through the gap undressing myself of tameness and timidity, I was gone. Oh, glorious the air and every waver in the coming night. A trail snaking in a crop of oat grass, I am invisible. Earth exhaling beneath me, saying here, there, and yes. I settle on my belly in the grass and heed night feathering the field. I am green. Crickets shake chinks and bells, sparks popping and jumping beyond. A rustling and I twitch. A bird sweeps the grass. I listen as her kin nestle in the trees. A scattered few fall from the sky, becoming brief flowers in nooks, then sailing up again, becoming leaves. Night swaddles them in boughs. I wait and listen. Something comes. I go back with the wind toward the wall, in and out the bramble, weaving westerly along it. I shape shift beside a rock, then a small clump of weed, a patch of blackness between shrubs. Revel, delighted Abyssinian. I sink into a dark pocket and become the hollow. Sidling across the field, almost as sleek as I, a beach white fox dips under the soft wave of summer wind, passes me, then drifts spirit-like before dispersing as smoke does in the western crop. Wherefore I venture from the wall and leave the cottage behind. Out in the cooling field, the wind bends north and chill, and I slink into guiding reaches of the field, seeking cover in a stand of old oaks. Beyond, the lamp and candle glow of the village. I rest for a time at the edge of the wood, back toward the cottage the swollen rose moon rises beside it. Turning, I flicker from tree to tree through acres of animate oak. We agree with the wind, band together, compose and thrum moon shadows.
pause as breezes pause. Sleep when it sleeps. Lifting as it lifts us all. By the time I come to the place where the wood meets the village, the moon is high. An unexpected gust and crackle sends me streaking, shaking a trail of catkin pollen behind in the clearing. The skirts of the village are silent and warm. Pad padding over cobblestone, in and out slant lantern light from windows, I come upon a most familiar place where the scent of fried fish melts like butter into the street. Jumping into a window box of catmint, I peer inside. The old man sits before the hearth, a bowl and spoon on his lap. He senses my presence at the window and looks up from his dinner. Ah, he exclaims, setting the bowl by the fire. Stooped, he rises, comes to the door. I am within faster than he can open it. The teat one, he whispers, reaching down, and strokes me from head to tail. Come in, come sit by the fire and eat. It has turned cold outside, yes? I follow him excitedly, mincing light as wheatgrass in the sun. Pert and polite upon the hearthstone, my tongue flourishes, as though there is another vivid one inside my black coat. He scoops from the wing of the fire a small piece of fish from the pan and places the warm fillet on the stone. We nibble together in the firelight. After our meal, we wash our faces. He moves from the stool to the armchair and I follow to snuggle in his lap. While he rubs my ears, he nods at sleepy flames. After a nap, I go to the garden door, and the old man pat-pats me goodnight before I blend into the shadows of the eaves. The light from the house flutters out, and the moon casts its whiteness over the small crop of vegetables, companion herbs and flowers. Everything fizzles in my vision. Bright celery tops, frizzed carrot greens bordered by foaming beds of coriander and parsley. Frosted lettuce and wisps of wild allium. Sturdy onion fans and leeks grow in rows. Pungent marigold tufts flank trellised tomatoes, towers of peas and beans hedge the south wall, blending into the dark borders around the cottage, my eyes wide open, I sit motionless, I wait, I watch. The moon rolls back in a starless sky. She gives me a clear view of everything. Something gropes under the tomato leaves. I pin the tail of the thief in sight and creep toward it as shadows of tree limbs assist with the moon. Slow. Steady, stealthy. Crouching round the pool of moonlight, I hunch beneath a row of towering bush beans. 
villus and fowl, a large frump rat splits tomato skins with long yellow teeth, spoiling the ripening fruits. From its shroud it cannot hear me, closer and closer. I spy the rodent through chewed holes in the undergrowth. Crack, slurp. It ruins half, then poisons another and another. The plant bleeds and the rat injects its bile, dropping excrement in the earth. I flex and lift every muscle in perfect Arching behind the rat, its neck within reach, I bristle and pounce. Flailing, its neck slung fast in my jaw, it spits and spews. The whipworm tail twists and I fight to claw the body to the ground, but the frenzied rat cranks its hindquarters and turns its teeth on me. I release just long enough to taunt the beast. It turns, hurls sour breath, threatens to strike, but rather with a second thought scrambles to escape. I spring. This time claws and teeth sink deep. The wheezing, squirming, jellied mass stifled in my bite. A growl comes up from somewhere inside me, and my heart is in my throat. Locking down, I grapple with the length of my catch, while the rat gasps its last. The old man appears. Da, Luca, the old man exclaims, his arm rod straight, lantern held high. I mew. Mouth full and drag the limp carcass an inch, dropping it in the gravel. Eloan, how did you do it? He asks. I tend to the burning spot on my chest. Luca, you caught him. My lovely, thank you. You're charming, charming. The old man picks the rat from the gravel by the tail, hangs the lantern on a post, opens the garden gate and handles the shovel leaning there. Together we bury the culprit outside. Let's go to sleep, Eloan. We have had too much excitement. I thought the world was coming to an end. Once inside, the old man pours water into a basin and washes his hands and the blood from my chest. He feeds me bits of ham and soft cheese. I wash my face and drink from a bowl of fresh water. We sit on the bed and he removes his slippers placing them neatly under the wooden chair. He snuffs the lantern wick, rests on his back, and pulls the coverlet to his chin. I curl under his arm and douse the moonlight shining in my eyes, closing my lids halfway, opening them just a bit, closing them again, a little more and a little more until it is dark. The old man rubs my ears. Thank you, thank you, little charm, he whispers, and we fall asleep under the garden window and white of the moon. In the morning, the old man is still sleeping I sit and look at his face, mewing to wake him. I want to go out, but he sleeps past the time when the sun is high. 
After relieving myself in a box of soil by the garden door, I jumped to the bed. Resting my chest on his chest, I pawed gently at the whiskers on his chin. He stirs, but does not open his eyes. I drowse beside him and dream I am sleeping beside a tree. The old man does not wake. A meal of crickets by the garden door, horse flies at the windows, fish flakes and burnt butter from the pan on the hearth satiate me. Jumping to the front sill, I peer across the narrow street. A woman is pinching withered geraniums from a flower box. Scratching at the glass, I call to her, making the loudest racket. She straightens, listens, turns and sees me. She walks to the door, knocks and enters. Ill one, she says to me quietly, trying to see in the gloom. I go to the bed and she follows, bends over the old man sleeping beneath the passing afternoon light from the little garden window. I sit under the chair by his slippers. The woman places her palm on the old man's forehead. Oh, she says. A familiar utterance, part of memory, when I saw a farmer standing by a lonely workhorse, found sleeping under a tree as I was passing by one October day. Oh, he had said, hat over his heart. The woman takes her hand from the old man's forehead and pats her breast. She leaves for a time. Villagers come in. Some stand together, murmuring. They glance toward the bed. My friend still in it. Some walk away, shaking their heads. One sits in the armchair, a hand over his mouth, the other at my side. Some stand by the bed and touch their eyes. The woman stays, whispers to those concerned, and leaves. At sunset, I make myself very small by the old man's slippers, watching the visiting shadows coming and going across the floor. No one notices me, and I fall asleep by the lantern flame. When I wake, the flame is high. A tired man sits in the chair, by the old man covered neatly in the bedclothes. A man in the chair clasps his hands in his lap, his head nodding at the emptiness. I jump to the bed and the tired man looks after me with drooping eyes. I leave by the open door and walk away from my friend still sleeping under his small garden window. Away from his small home, I meander the curling streets and huddled homes following the narrow road and over the confines of the village. By a protected place under a wheelbarrow, I wash my burning chest and the length of my coat. The moon in the east blooms behind the old oak wood lighting itself between the trunks of the trees like white early morn through a lattice. I leave this place to travel toward the river to the west. 
I fish for minnow in the shallow water of the river's edge, catch moths and make a meal of few before going along with the current. When the moon is overhead, I look for a place to sleep. Up ahead, a bank of clouds looms and the river runs away from the coming storm. By a bent crust of withered trees, I find a tipped abandoned basket a few feet from the river, shrinking inside the splintered shell. I clean the river and my travels from my fur. A stinging spot on my chest festers and fatigue overcomes me. I can see a bubbling polyp of rats on the far shoal of the river, but I am fevered and have no desire to frighten them. They are busy with some dead thing and would not dare to meet me. Retreating further inside the basket, I tumble into a moonless sleep, hot and fitful nightmares of pale, rigid tails, red-eyed bandits with clamped mouths and rusty teeth, rodents with fermenting stomachs leave droppings in the old man's bed while he sleeps. I chase them through the nightmares, but tire going nowhere. When I wake, my bones and flesh are aflame with fever and my tongue is shrunken with thirst. Drugged by fever, I do not seek water. My chest is swollen and my throat is tight. The infection is sticky and matted around the broken skin. Feebly, I attempt to clean it. Leaving the river, I go east, where the gray light from the rising sun dilutes in a humid tomb of storm clouds. The fever leads me through strange places, where rabbits pray beside a hole and a mound of earth at the foot of an ancient oak. The knelling of the church bells follow me reverberating and making lead of my bones. I see a white-haired lady, clad in white, a blanched herb basket under her arm. Her hands stretched out toward me. She opens her mouth to speak as I pass, but the coming storm in the oak leaves says, I roam for a long while, but she is there again, 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 and the fever chiming of the bells is resonant and ponderous across the fields. Q, Q, Q. Seems days have passed by the time I reach the village again. At the old man's house I jump to the sill, but his bed is bare, chairs empty, the hearth is cold. Out in the clearing, southeast of the village, the churning clouds spew shards and pins needling me with rain. The wind swoops beneath me as if it wants to toss me over the rooftops until I enter the forest of old oaks. The storm crackles and spits. Winds tear yellow beaded catkins from oaks, scattering remains, then stirring them in a cauldron of fallen leaves and empty acorn cups. I settle between the roots of the largest oak, my heart charred within the fire in my chest. Huddled there at the foot of the tree, I tuck myself under my belly and close my eyes. An 
eternity passes and the gray day is locked immobile in the storm. Every hour seems a long night. Finally the rain eases, invites the evening stepping in, mists the meadow and trickles through the buttresses of the oaks. In the distance, beyond the trees, a beech white fox drifts in from the wet night of the field like pale bellflowers appear from rotted wood or soil. Eyes closed, I fall through empty spaces of eternity. Then, through the darkness, something comes and settles beside me like a feathery pappus. Thank you, thank you, little charm. Oh, Q, what happened? A sweet voice stops my falling, picks me up, and folds me into clean, soft wool. The scent of her cottage and the white reed herb basket I like to sleep in. The light from her lantern casts its warm circle around quick, gentle hands, her deep blue cloak, and me. Where have you been? I think of the old man sleeping in his bed, of his garden, the rat buried outside, the river, the fevered storm and the old oaks. She lifts me, carrying me from the wood. I in my basket sail over the field until we meet the light of the cottage. All is well, Q, she whispers. Past the fairy hawthorn we go, and through the garden gate, past the blue hortensia pom-poms and over the soft grass. We stop, and she sets me in my basket by her feet, turning to free her cloak from the blackberry thorns. I am resting in the basket for some moments in the grass, and oh, the little candle flame in the kitchen window skips and hops. Closing the garden gate and lifting her lantern, she carries me across the garden to the kitchen door.